I wanted to play this clip here um, mm -hmm. before because I think we're I think we're going to focus on on the Marxism stuff because I have a lot on that, especially in the mm -hmm. post game. I want to keep in the '90s just for a second before we get to the 2000s because um, wow. this is I don't know if you've seen this. This is Hitchens um, with a little David Frum um, talking about healthcare. Oh yeah. yeah. Canadian, aren't you? Are you, are you? are you a refugee from the single payer? Do you consider yourself well, to be? Um, the, the, the summary line of the Canadian health care system is Canada is a great place to be when you're not sick. That if you twist your ankle, I'd much rather twist my ankle in Toronto than in Washington. Um, I go to a hospital, the doctor looks at me, I come out again, no paperwork, no forms to fill out. If, however, I'm sick, um, if I need an MRI, if I need a CAT scan, if I need a world-level surgeon, I would much rather be in the United States than in Canada. That, um, that for all its bureaucracy and, in, and inefficiencies um, and inconveniences, the American system does do a better job of providing high technological medicine than the Canadian. There are more, uh, I, think, I think there are more CAT scan machines in metropolitan Washington than in all of Canada. Well, the United States is a, is a richer country, too. But I mean, as someone really who was brought up in, um, brought, I mean, can't believe that one couldn't close the technical gap without um, compromising the principle of health care. I mean, I, I just. I think it's just extraordinary that this country and South Africa are the only countries that can be described as advanced, which don't have a national health provision of some kind or another. And my experiences with, with it here seem to have persuaded me, at any rate, that they combine the worst of capitalism with the worst of socialism. I mean, you can turn up, and if you haven't got a visa card on you, they'll send you away. But the amount of paperwork and bureaucracy and, and paper shuffling and, and duplication of work that's involved in doing it is absolutely terrifying and w would disgrace a Stalinist banana republic. Yeah, and yet it's all for profit. How's that compared to England, by the way? Britain has a national health, mm -hmm. health, health, health treatment is a right in Britain. Mm -hmm. And it's the one thing of the, of the, the post, the one aspect, the one achievement, I should better say, of the post-war Labour government um, that not even Mrs. Thatcher uh, dared to touch. Yeah, uh, so, so I think that um, in 1996, Hitchens comes out with this book called Blood, Class, and Empire mm. uh, about the Anglo-American relationship. And I don't remember if he uses this line in the book, but definitely in some interviews about the book, he has this line about how um, you know, he really hates what, what Anglophile means in the U.S. and what pro-American means in, in England because you know, in, in, in the United States, he says Anglophile means that you like you know, the monarchy and country manners and masterpiece theater and all that shit. And in, uh, and in the UK saying you're pro American means that, you know, what, what do you say that you, uh, you, you know, you want our boys at MI5 to be best friends with the boys at Langley, uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and, and he says it would be so, it would be so much better if Anglophile meant that you wanted to copy Britain's uh, national health service and pro American, pro American means they meant that you thought that uh, the UK should copy America's Freedom of Information Act. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it, it is interesting. Um, you know, there, you get that little nationals glint right there in the pride of, of uh, the NHS. And honestly, that's a good thing. Um, I, I do like the, the kind of structural point that he makes here about Thatcher being unable to touch a system like that, right? It actually, you know, you get to enter into some form of post politics. Not that the NHS is particularly mm -hmm. safe from right wing cuts, but no one in their serious minds is talking about, you know, its eradication. Um, I think we're good on clips for this side, Matt. So you don't have to worry All about right. it, um, by the way. But um, yeah, anyways, I, I thought that was an interesting clip just because you do see, you know, a few years Hitchens and from, you know, joining um, arms together. Um, you know, in support of the American yeah, yeah. invasion of, of Iraq. So maybe we can start there and then we have to, you know, just for anyone who's watching, we're definitely going to get to his atheism and, and all of yeah. that, but we're going a little chronological, which I think is helpful with Hitchens because people, you know, you sort of watch him on YouTube. He's all over the place. You know, we're keeping in line. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that there is definitely a strand that you identified earlier and, I think it's a little ambiguous uh, what the timeline is for some of this, but that they, mm -hmm. that like, okay, clearly in 1971, you know, he believes, uh, you know, he believes like he's a, he's like a very orthodox Marxist. Uh, and, um, 
and you know he does say that he left the group that he was part of the international socialists you know what later became the socialist workers party which ironically probably you know <laughs> was 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 like the main element in the stop the war coalition in you know, like 2002 and 2003 yeah. in the uk uh but um you know that he you know because he'd sort of devoted his life you know like a few you know several years of his life to this group and he said he, he kind of left when he realized that you know, 1968 wasn't actually the beginning of some sort of great revolutionary wave, you know, that that, that was sort of where it was cresting. Uh, and I think even in that debate from 1986 uh, that you played the clip from earlier against the, the Ayn Rand cultists, he is, you know, I think there's a little bit of a disconnect because he is clearly a very orthodox Marxist in terms of how he sort of conceives the, like, end state of, uh, of socialism. That, yes. You know, that, you know, he is... You know, he's, he's laying out, you know, like this, like you listen to that part, you just play. It's like, man, this is a guy who like really knows his marks and you know, really believes this stuff. Uh, but I think that on even in that debate on the sort of subject of the path from here to there. Yes. Right. Yes. Like, like, like I think he's gotten pretty, like in some ways it's gotten pretty incremental as social democratic. Right. Cause, cause, cause I think that's kind of what he could imagine at that point. Right. You know, that, that, that we could have like, a little bit of social democracy and then a little bit more social democracy and, you know, and then who knows, right. You know, but it, it's sort of, you know, it's gotten almost like a little bit Fabian, I think. And, and I think that that that's a thread that can maybe help you understand some of what's going on, because I think that, I think he was, he was still very committed to socialist values as he understood them. But like, I think a sort of Marxist analysis of what's going, you know, of like the sort of, um, how we're going to go from capitalism to socialism, you know, is at least frame. No, I, I think that that's such a, a, a good point. And like the, you know, his, the bit about the vehicle, because yeah, you, you are right. Even in that debate, there is, yeah, there's an absence of, of how we get there. And I think that's maybe what I find the most lacking um, in a lot of his like Marxism that we saw in the eighties and nineties, just to fill in the blank though, Ben, if you don't mind, mm -hmm. for people who are familiar with the term Fabian, because I actually think that's a very good like term and I, I actually pretty decent way to describe some of his, uh, his socialism. Yeah, I mean Matt. Matt would actually be able to do better than I can out here, but like it's a, it's a, you know, just just because I know he's like read some of the stuff uh, yeah. and uh, and talked about it, but it's it's a non-Marxist tradition of, of British socialism that's very much about the idea of a of of sort of a benevolent, um, you know, kind of elite group sort of guiding society, you know, in in a more progressive uh, direction. So it it's like if you read. Uh, Hal Draper's classic uh, pamphlet, mm -hmm. uh, The Two Souls of Socialism. You know, he talks about socialism from above and socialism from below uh, as the sort of key difference between Karl Marx and other 19th century socialists. Uh, you know, that, you know, like Fabianism is, is sort of, at least the way I'm using the term, it might be a simplification of what some of these guys thought, but like is sort of the ultimate, you know, socialism from above, not in the kind of like, you know, aggressive Stalinist form, maybe of socialism from above, but socialism from above in a sort of very gentle social democratic kind of way. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's really interesting in, I don't know if we'll uh, get time to uh, get, have time to get to it in the post game, but in the John Rodden discussion about George Orwell, um, yeah. Rodden points out that Orwell was a socialist, but not a progressive because he didn't have a doctrine of progress. It mm -hmm. seems to me uh -huh. that Hitchens really did. <laughs> Hitchens mm -hmm. really did believe in progress. Um, and in there, and he kind of like ditched the socialism a little bit, which is a, that's an interesting. Yeah. That, that Hitchens is a progressive. It, it sticks kind of, but, and I think it, it also fits very well with his um, relationship, like with the Fabian analogy really works there too, because so much of Hitchens attraction, like to Marxism, um, you know, while, you know, there are stories and I think you note them in, in your book, Ben too, about him saying things like he does want like the everyday guy to run society. I think that's something that you note from his time in England. Mm -hmm. um, they use some kind of terrible British term that I'm, I'm not even going to pretend to remember. Yeah, it's, um, it's, 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 it's it was either Yobbs or Burks, right? You know, but, yes. it's, but, it, but, it, but it's like when they're both working at the New Statesman, um, you know, Martin Amos, uh, who, who's, who's a guy who, you know, um, like I, you can probably tell if you read the book, like I, 
I actually think he's a really good novelist, but like he's kind of an yeah. idiot when he talks about politics. This is amazing. <laughs> I remember the uh, first time night. listening to him talk about World War II and just being like, Lord in heaven, what is it going on in this guy's brain? <laughs> Honestly, like Hitchens association with Martin Amos and Salman Rushdie Ugh. probably on roaded me to I was an English major and then Hitchens uh. sort of combining those realms where he, he'll like reference HG Wells or something like that in the context of talking about Hitler. Right. Like um, uh, that was really appealing. But yeah, it th- keep talking about uh, Amos. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, yeah. So I, I, I think. um you know, and, and you could see the mutual appeal, right? Because both of those guys are very into sort of, um, you know, like good writing, you know, as, mm-hmm. as, as a sort of as a value unto itself, you know, which which is not like I'm not saying that as an insult, you know, it is a value. But, you know, like, I think, um, you know, obviously, it's not the only one. Uh, so. Uh, so yeah, they're in the in the seven days, you know, they're both writing the new statesman and, and Amos, you know, says, and by the way, Amos following the conversation, right, you know, is like really Christopher Fair, like I can't believe this. Like you really want like the Yobs or the Burks, you know, whatever phrase he uses, like some like insulting phrase for like, you know, ordinary, you know, uh, you know, like working class people, you know, like like you, know, you yeah. really want these guys running society and, and Hitchens like, yeah, absolutely. You know, that, that's the that that is that is that is the goal of everything, you know, that the Yobs will be, you know, we running everything. And Amos's dad, we should just point out, was a novelist, uh, and Kingsley. not only that, but like a, a like a yeah, King's Amos didn't he, wasn't he like a teacher at either Oxford or Cambridge or so? He was a campus novelist, and so it's like mm-hmm. you know that's, yeah, yeah. that's I, the I, world that Amos is coming from. Yeah, I should say by the way, um, there's like a couple pages just because like I, I you know I couldn't you know I couldn't do write a book about Christopher Hitchens and not include this right, but like I I, I couldn't justify more than a couple pages. There's like a couple pages about the drinking and in there. Uh, I, I really wanted to quote, but I, I just could not work it in in a way that felt natural. Uh, so Kingsley Amos wrote this book called uh, Everyday Drinking, which is like a book. I have of, a like, copy. Co- <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a book of cocktail recipes and like commentary. And some know. of them are just disgusting. Sorry, but not to cut you <laughs> off, but just nasty, na- nasty, nasty little British cocktails, like sad <laughs> island things, man. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you, you try to actually make those things. Just like, pouring oh, booze into a cup. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, 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 exactly. But, um, but uh, you know, Hitchens wrote the introduction to the, to this book, and um, he says this thing about how you know Kingsley, you know, was always very uh, uh, you know generous, uh, you know, host. You know that that his rule was that you know he'd pour your first drink, and then after that, you know, it was up to you to you know like you know where it is, right? You know, if we fill it, mm-hmm. and then. But then he was contrasting that to some party they were at, and uh, and Kingsley, um, Kingsley Amos um, uh, drops his cup on the floor and it smashes, and then he says to the host, "Oh well, at least it was at least it was empty." And then Hitchens' comment on that is is a poor sort of host who needs that kind of reminder, as like, okay, so just to review. Like this guy, <laughs> like Kingsley Amos intentionally broke somebody else's glass because he was pissed that like it had been too long since he got a refill and Kingsley Martin and Christopher all agree that, oh yeah, that guy was the asshole in this situation. And can you, because you can also imagine that party knowing how notorious Kingsley was for drinking a lot. Um, you know, somebody said like, you know, he's had his like fourth martini. I'm maybe going to slow it down a little bit. <laughs> you know? um, yeah, it is tr- truly amazing.